program seminar. It's a seminar of the Department of Epidemiology. Um, and it's, a, in American parlance, a double, double header. We first have uh, Dr. Molly Wood, and then the second will be Dr. Bahare Razuli. And uh, it's my great pleasure now for a moment to introduce um, Molly, Molly Wood. Um, she is now an assistant professor of epidemiology in the Department of Environmental and uh, Public Health of the University of Cincinnati, but she was, of course, with us before. Her advisor was Sonia Hernandez, and uh, Molly uh, is a reproductive and perinatal pharmacoepidemiologist, particularly interested in um, benefits of medicine during pregnancy, particularly medications using to, to treat pain and psychiatric illness, migraine, depression, and also in, in pharmacogenetics. And she works, she will probably show that in large administrative databases in the US, but also in Europe and Scandinavia. Molly, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to give you this introduction. I'll give you the floor to talk about migraine and the risk of hypertensive outcomes in pregnancy. Please go ahead. May I invite everybody to, I think everybody did this, but to mute so that we know that we can follow, follow uh, Molly. Thank you for the introduction. I'll just uh, take a moment to um, choose which of these share screen slides I wanna choose. I think it's this one. Okay. Um, are we seeing the main slide screen and not my notes, hopefully? Some yes. thumbs up from anyone? Yes, okay. It's okay, uh, uh, yeah. Thank you, Molly. Uh, I like to maintain the illusion that I do this off the cuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's really nice to be back at HSPH, even if it's only virtual. Um, I'm gonna talk today about research from my postdoc with Sonia Hernandez-Diaz uh, that's wrapping up now. And uh, this project was funded by Eric Grimm's T32 on cardiovascular outcomes. Oh, come on. Okay, there we go. So uh, as a condition in need of better characterization and understanding, migraine is a pretty good one to look at. Um, it's incredibly disabling, one of the top 20 most disabling conditions as, uh, as classified by the WHO. Uh, a migraine attack is characterized by intense pain, sensitivity to stimuli, especially light, and is often heralded by a transient sensory experience, uh, often visual, although not always, called an aura. It's also common. Uh, as many as one in three women of reproductive age have some history of migraine. And while pregnancy can temporarily resolve migraine for about half of women who had a diagnosis before becoming pregnant, the remaining half will continue to have symptoms. Uh, migraine has been associated with both an increased risk of cardiovascular outcomes such as stroke uh, in the general population, as well as poor pregnancy outcomes. Uh, many of the studies that have led to these conclusions are based on smaller volunteer cohorts uh, with a few notable exceptions. Uh, such as the Nurses Health Study, um, and many lack careful consideration of the role of treatment. So it's important to remember that treatment is absolutely vital to day-to-day -day functioning uh, for many people with migraine, and nearly 90% of adult migrators use at least one prescription drug to manage their condition. Treatment includes both drugs to prevent attacks, which could include antihypertensives, anti-seizure or anti-epileptic drugs, and antidepressants, as well as drugs to treat the symptoms of the attack. So this could include opioids, um, analgesics such as NSAIDs or acetaminophen, or the tryptans. 40% of adults with migraine use both an acute and a preventive treatment. So the first aim of this project was to understand patterns of single drug and polypharmacy treatments in a cohort of pregnant women with migraine. So data for this project come from IBM MarketScan, which is a large administrative database made up of commercially insured individuals in the US. Pregnancies are identified through codes indicating the end of pregnancy. And then within the sample of pregnant women, we identify women with evidence of migraine in the three months prior to pregnancy, 
using uh, some combination of ICD-9 codes and prescription pills. So our sample size of women we eventually identified as having migraine uh, with, included about 8,000 women, identified out of about 850,000 pregnant women with health and prescription insurance coverage from 90 days before pregnancy until delivery. So this is a figure that includes six alluvial plots from a descriptive study. Um, these figures include only women who filled at least one prescription for the drug in question at some point during the time period. So I'm going to focus here on the tryptins just to orient you to the figure because there's kind of a lot going on. Um, so as I said, these only include women uh, with at least one prescription for the drug at some point during the study period. The x-axis proceeds across time, with the left side being the 90 days before the start of pregnancy, and then through the first, second, and third trimesters. The percent filling at each time point is given on the y-axis, so you can see about 47% of women filled a prescription for a tryptin at some point during the study, most of which were before pregnancy. The darker color in each bar indicates that a prescription was filled during that interval, and the flows between the bars show the longitudinal trajectories for groups of individuals. So you can see that about a third of those filling a prescription before pregnancy do not fill one in the first trimester, for example. So antiepileptics, antidepressants, and tryptans, you can see those in 1B, C, and D here, are rapidly discontinued at pregnancy onset and acquire few new users during pregnancy. Antihypertensives are discontinued by some users but persist for a subset of women throughout pregnancy, and some new users begin treatment late in pregnancy. Opioids and acetaminophen appear to be used intermittently before and during pregnancy with no apparent rapid discontinuation. So this is a seldom used uh, but very straightforward way to visualize longitudinal patterns in categorical data. There are 16 possible paths or trajectories that an individual could follow, but some of them are extremely unusual or even unobserved in our data. Uh, so one thing we might want to do is to uh, reduce the number of trajectories to the sort of, um, to do a kind of data reduction to get a sense of the most salient or important patterns. So the first step of data reduction, we used a group-based trajectory model approach, which is an unsupervised clustering method based on finite mixture models. So briefly, we tested models with between two and six groups, <clears throat> including uh, zero, first, second, and third order polynomial shapes, and selected a set of candidate models based on statistical criteria. So this includes model fit statistics like the BIC, as well as the odds of correct classification. Uh, and then from the set of models that we felt had reasonable statistical um, properties, we selected the final model uh, in consultation with a neurologist, in this case, uh, Rebecca Birch, who's a co-author on this paper. So <clears throat> using acetaminophen as an example, the final model we selected identified four groups. The majority of our sample had either a zero low probability of filling a prescription for acetaminophen, or were using at a relatively high rate before pregnancy, but discontinued over the course of pregnancy. However, we also observed groups of women with a high constant probability of prescription fill, at, as well as a group that increased their use. Both antidepressants and antiepileptics were separated into continuers, discontinuers, and never users. Uh, tryptins were similar, with the main difference between users being the speed of discontinuation. Uh, antihypertensives included a fourth group of new users. And opioids had a group of nearly 10% of the sample with high constant use, as well as a low constant in a moderate decreasing group. So this gets us some interesting information about what exposure patterns may be most common, but it doesn't tell us anything about how the medications are used together, which is what we really wanted to know for this project. If we were to exhaustively code trajectories for all combinations of the six drug classes, each with two treatment categories assessed at four time points, we would, need a variable with, <clears throat> we would need a variable with more than 1 million categories. So clearly some further data reduction is in order. To carry out further data reduction, we used group-based uh, 
multi-trajectory models, which are an extension of the models used on the previous slide. This allows us to identify groups of pregnant women with migraine for whom the use of these six medication classes was similar. Our best fitting solution, which I'll show you in just a moment, um, identified uh, six groups of women with migraine that met model fitting criteria, again, in consultation with a neurologist. So just a quick orientation, Let's see. Um, reading across the graph within a single color, here we're looking at acetaminophen in black, we can see the trajectories of one medication across the six groups of patients with migraine. The horizontal line is the pre predicted probability of filling a prescription and the vertical bars are the observed percentages filling a prescription. We see the group on the far left uh, rapidly discontinuing, the group on the far right showing high constant use and increasing among these women, for example. If we read down a column, uh, there it is, um, we can see the prescription filling behavior for six different drug classes within one of the groups. Within this group, we see a low but sustained use of hypertensives, Tryptans, antidepressants, and antiepileptics anti going from relatively high before pregnancy and decreasing throughout, and very high sustained opioid prescription fills. So we then looked at the medication and the comorbidities uh, together, well, along with the utilization. And again, leaning heavily on uh, Rebecca Birch, our neurologist colleague here, assigned labels to the groups we'd identified. So these included a group with moderate severity, um, high psychiatric comorbidity, high prevalence of other pain conditions, a high cardiovascular comorbidity, a low severity group, and a medically complex group. So we do think it's important to note that at least for some women in the sample, we noted an increasing reliance on opioids and acetaminophen during pregnancy, coupled with the discontinuation of other medications with more proven migraine efficacy. So to give you a sense of what's going on with these comorbidities, these are some of the characteristics we observed for the best fitting six group model. So again, these are based on ICD-9 diagnosis and procedure codes recorded in the 90 days before pregnancy. I just wanted to highlight two things. First, as we saw on the previous slide, we have a small subgroup characterized by sustained antihypertensive use, who also more often carry diagnoses for hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. Second, even though we don't have detailed data on the course of migraine and frequency of attacks, these two groups suggest we may be able to distinguish severity or at least complexity uh, based on identifying latent variables. In this case, groups based on longitudinal treatment trajectories. So these methods are powerful tools to describe exposures occurring in our data. Our initial hypothesis that a substantial group of women in our sample would increasingly rely on opioids and acetaminophen does seem borne out by these results. I should note that there's an interest, at least in the repro, uh, repro perinatal pharmacoepi research world, it's a small world, but uh, we're very enthusiastic. Um, there's an interest in using these trajectories as, uh, as a definition of effect, uh, or as exposures rather when estimating the effect of a medication on, for example, the risk of a malformation. Uh, it's important, of course, to remember that these methods don't get us out of thinking carefully about time-varying exposure and confounding. Um, using antihypertensives as an example here is unlikely that 5% of our sample decided at random to initiate beta blockers and far more likely that a hypertensive event occurred later in pregnancy uh, for which she received treatment. And even in the absence of time varying confounding, uh, risk communication during these trajectories or using these trajectories is challenging. It's hard to tell a woman, don't be in trajectory C, for example, or don't be in low decreasing uh, compared to use or don't use during the first trimester. Um, I think it's also important to note that as with any method uh, that's looking for latent or unobserved variables in data, risk of overextraction is a problem. Um, these groups aren't real in the sense that we haven't discovered um, previously ununderstood subgroups of migraine. We're just identifying women with similar trajectories of medication use. Um, this, this method and related methods will almost always find groups, even when uh, no groups truly exist. There's a lot of uh, really good 
methods work on this. Um, if anyone's interested, I'm happy to recommend some papers. So now, uh, just quickly, I'm going to move into migraine and the hypertensive outcomes during pregnancy. Largely motivated by what we saw with this, uh, with this trajectory group in particular, the uh, cardiovascular comorbidity group. Um, what we see here is a high persistent antihypertensive use, a uh, higher prevalence of pre-pregnancy hypertension, obesity, and diabetes, um, and during pregnancy, two to three times higher use of prenatal care. So for the outcome study, we altered eligibility criteria slightly to use a less strict definition of migraine and to require that migraine be present before the start of pregnancy to avoid potential misclassification with the outcomes of interest, which can initially present with severe headache. So we also wanted to require insurance coverage 30 days post-delivery hospitalization to ensure we captured all of the outcomes of interest, which are coded at the, as part or which are coded as part of the delivery hospitalization and can show up after birth. After applying eligibility criteria, we have uh, about 22,000 pregnancies classified as having migraine, of which 17,000 had a live or still birth, and about 5,000 ended in spontaneous abortion. This is just a diagram to illustrate when during the, uh, during the pregnancy observation period, various uh, exposure, confounder, and outcome variables were recorded. So for example, our baseline confounders are recorded in the 90 days before pregnancy and include age, region, and year, as well as parity, smoking, cardiovascular diagnosis codes, other comorbidities, and indicators of healthcare utilization. We're also going to be looking at uh, hypertension as a potential effect modifier that was also recorded in the 90 days before pregnancy. Um, we have two different windows for medication fills, either in the 90 days before or in the uh, up to week 20 in the first part of pregnancy, looking at antihypertensives in particular. Um, the outcomes we we're interested in included placental outcomes such as placenta previa, placental abruption, um, as well as preeclampsia, transient hypertension of pregnancy, preterm birth, and small for gestational age. Uh, we also looked at spontaneous abortion occurring in the early part of pregnancy. Uh, so with the goal of estimating the effect of migraine on pregnancy outcomes, adjusting for those baseline confounders, we used inverse probability of treatment weights to look at uh, the effect of migraine associated um, uh, the effect of my, of, <laughs> excuse me, the association between migraine and pregnancy outcomes using IPT weights to control for baseline confounding, and then potentially the joint effect of migraine alone, hypertension alone, and migraine and hypertension together. Okay, um, this is a figure with a lot of things going on, so let me just note along the left hand side, you can see the outcomes listed. At the bottom, spontaneous abortion, um, and then going up, placenta accreta, previa, and placental abruption, as well as a composite placental outcome, because many of the, uh, the numbers for the specific placental outcomes are very small. Um, preeclampsia, including uh, severe preeclampsia and superimposed hypertension, um, transient hypertension of pregnancy, postpartum hemorrhage, preterm birth, and small for gestational age. Um, so I'm showing here uh, the unadjusted effect or association shown as a, as a gray circle. Um, the uh, estimate adjusted only for age, region, and year of last menstrual period uh, showed as a, as a purple triangle and then fully adjusted for the baseline confounders. Um, and that's the, the red square. So what we see here is a, um, a relatively increased risk for almost all of these outcomes, um, including spontaneous abortion, preeclampsia in all of its various uh, iterations, um, transient hypertension of pregnancy, and preterm birth. We didn't see any evidence of an effect of migraine on small for gestational age or postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, because these uh, placental outcome numbers are quite small, um, you can see that the, the signal in, indicates an increased risk, but the confidence intervals are very wide. Um, when we look at the uh, 
individual effects of migraine and hypertension, and then the joint effect of migraine and hypertension together. Um, I'm just going to note that um, the superimposed hypertension is sort of messing up our axis here. So I'm going to click on to a graph that doesn't show that, uh, just so we don't get that compression around, uh, around one in the way that we did before. Um, so again, reference is, a, um, is lined up on the risk ratio of one. Migraine alone is a red triangle. Hypertension alone is a purple triangle. And uh, comorbid migraine and hypertension is a dark red square. Um, so for most of these, we continue to see an elevated risk associated with migraine and a much stronger risk associated with hypertension. And for a couple of these outcomes, including the placental outcomes, um, but also uh, preeclampsia, what we see is um, an elevated risk of migraine, an elevated risk of hypertension, but either no effect or in some cases a protective effect um, of having those two, uh, those two baseline conditions together. So if we take a closer look at what's happening with preeclampsia, um, I, just as an example, um, this is where I started to get into modeling of treatment. And it turns out that at least with the data we have, our effect estimates for treatment are um, perhaps intractably confounded by indication, at least um, given the data we have to control confounding here. But the idea that we had was that um, if you have both hypertension and pregnancy uh, and migraine uh, before your pregnancy, you are more likely to both receive an antihypertensive treatment and sustain it during pregnancy. Um, so perhaps these women in the doubly exposed category are actually more, more likely to be on a treatment that could uh, directly address the pregnancy outcome uh, that we're interested in. Um, so this is a descriptive um, uh, explanation rather than a statistical explanation for this potential uh, protective joint effect of having both migrated and hypertension. And this is the work in progress as referenced in the seminar title. So uh, in these conclusions, I just want to note uh, migraine is associated with higher risk of spontaneous abortion, preeclampsia, preterm birth, and placental abruption. Uh, chronic hypertension is a much stronger risk factor than migraine. Um, for some of these outcomes, the joint effect of uh, migraine and hypertension may appear protective, which could be explained by treatment, um, but we're having a very hard time um, getting a reasonable estimate for treatment in, in these models. So I, I think I might have run over by a minute, possibly, but I want to thank uh, my co-authors and mentors, uh, Sonia Hernandez-Diaz uh, and Rebecca Birch, the H4P Pregnancy Pharmacoepi Group at the Medical School and the Brigham, and of course, my funding from Eric, um, who I'm not sure if he's here today, but this was uh, an enormous opportunity and I'm incredibly grateful. Um, happy to take questions now or email me later. Um, and thank you so much for the invitation and the chance to speak with everybody. Great pleasure now to, in our second presentation, go to Bahare Razuli, Bahare, um, a postdoc in two institutions, uh, at our Harvard Gen School, but also at the Karolinska, and in fact, at the end of the academic, no, not academic, calendar year, you go to, uh, to Stockholm again. Um, Pare is working um, with Gunars Dane as, a, as an advisor, um, risk factor for primary and secondary hypertension and chronic diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, a big uh, set of questions you have in there, and you have worked on um, electronic medical records as well. And your title is, and I'm going to read it full because it's a long one, but important. Combining high quality data with rigorous methods, emulating a target trial using electronic medical records and a case control design for comparative effectiveness research. Dr. Razuli, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman for introduction. Uh, and let me share my screen. Um, yes. Excellent. So do you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. 
Uh, thank you again and thank you for everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon for this seminar. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to present uh, my work in progress. Uh, I'm a postdoc working with Dr. Gudars Danayi uh, and this is one of the projects that uh, I am working uh, in uh, as a postdoc uh, in his group. Uh, so, uh, the title, as uh, Dr. Hoffman read, emulating target trials using electronic me medical records and, case, uh, and the case control, these are for comparative effectiveness research. Uh, and uh, I'm going today to give um, an overview of the, about uh, um, these uh, methods that we, are, we have used and why we have used those methods. Uh, so I spend most of the time to, to give uh, a background about uh, um, so why we use these methods and how we apply them in the case control design. Uh, and maybe um, the last five minutes, I talk about the results of the clinical example that we use for, uh, to apply and show that how these methods are working. Uh, and the clinical example uh, is uh, about statin use and risk of fatal and non-fatal uh, myocardial infarction. Uh, and uh, yes, so let me. Uh, so usually to uh, make an informed uh, decision uh, in uh, relate, something related to public health, we need uh, to have some evidence. And usually we generate uh, this evidence uh, by uh, using the comparative effectiveness research, uh, which is like, for example, we want to decide that if this treatment, treatment here, when I say treatment, it means health, any health related intervention. Uh, if this treatment is uh, beneficial, is harmful, or compared to the other treatment, which of them is better? Uh, so this is what we, I call it as a comparative effectiveness research. And the usually randomized clinical trial are, we consider them as gold standard to answer such questions. Uh, they are uh, the preferred study design. Uh, to provide answer for uh, such questions, um, but uh, we, we can't always uh, conduct and uh, use the results of randomized trial because uh, either they are unethical to conduct such studies uh, or are costly, impractical, or takes a lot of time. So in the absence of the, uh, what should we do in the absence of having uh, good uh, clinical trial to answer such questions. We can use observational data and observational data, there are like, they can come from different uh, designs or resources uh, like epidemiological studies, which like uh, court studies, case control studies, uh, or there are also uh, a lot of uh, data can come from, uh, for example, Health, medic, health records, electronic medical records, or health national registries, which are uh, collected for another purposes, but now they are increasingly used for the, um, uh, in epidemiological studies uh, because they are available. And if we can um, combine using those methods with uh, some kind of advanced analytical methods, we can answer uh, many of the uh, questions. Uh, but we are also now that these uh, observational data, usually they are biased, like as you know, one of the well-known biases that are confounding uh, because we don't do randomized randomization. And also there are some um, evidence to show that, show that most of these like uh, particularly electronic medical records, uh, maybe there are a lot of measurement errors. Uh, and uh, so uh, for the measurement errors, uh, I will come back to it, we'll come back to that in uh, like in after a couple of slides um, to like, of course, like to have a good data, we need to collect the data, the uh, validated those data. Uh, and uh, it's not the case in using most of the, uh, these um, like say registries or uh, EMR data. Um, so, uh, also the, some of the uh, other biases, we can at least by increasing, improving the design of the study, we can minimize those biases. Uh, so, 
uh, one of the suggested strategy is that to use uh, think that okay how are you going how would you answer this question if you could uh, conduct a clinical trial and then you draft outline it uh, protocol for that trial and then by using your observational data you see that uh, which component of this uh, protocol you can uh, emulate uh, to uh, to conduct that study so usually we start when we want to use uh, observational data usually we start by outlining a um, protocol for a hypothetical randomized trial uh, and uh, so for when we had like um, and usually the best like after like the ransom trial everyone like talk about in observational studies cohort design is most preferred design uh, of collecting uh, such data uh, so uh, we we already uh, just like uh, previously developed and published the uh, a lot of methods that how we can use this like uh, causal uh, methods uh, when we have the cohort uh, data uh, to emulate and design of critical trials um, and uh, but as i said in like a couple of slides before uh, sometimes you need to validate data um, there are some studies show that the uh, for example um, some studies show that that they measured outcome only based on ICD codes, but then they did some validation study and showed that this, uh, the, most of the, uh, for example, outcome measurements that they, have, they use on the ICD codes, they were, uh, there were a lot of error. Uh, so, and, but how we can like validate, um, say, if we have a cohort study with thousands uh, participants, it will be very costly to validate data for all of the participants in that uh, core study. Uh, or sometimes it's not only validation, sometimes you, uh, you want to collect more data for a subsample of the study. So then we can say that nested case control design is a um, uh, design that uh, allows us spending the same resources uh, and to get high quality data or supplemental data that uh, we may need to answer some of the research questions uh, for cases and a smaller number of the controls. So it's a more efficient way of uh, conducting a, a cohort uh, if we design a good case control study. But the problem is that most of the case control studies are poorly designed. Uh, but when I say that poorly designed, I just said uh, there are some case control study that they like uh, they design them well, but like say conventional or the case control uh, studies, we call it as poorly designed because some people, they don't like we call them conventional case control <laughs> studies. Uh, and when I say that, it means that, uh, for example, when a case happened here in this uh, schematic graph that I uh, created, for example, for case I, A, uh, we, for example, based on information on, um, in the electronic medical record, we find out that this is a case and this is an event date. And this is a date we go back retrospectively, uh, collect information about uh, uh, confounder, exposure, uh, and eligibility. Everything is uh, measuring at index date. Uh, and also this is an incident density uh, sampling design. So say for this case, we sample two controls and we do exactly the same thing. So we collect information for uh, controls uh, also uh, at the index state. Uh, so the information, it is what we say that this inherited, this bias by design of the study um, are collected at the index state. Uh, so the, it's one of the biases may happen is that is the prevalent user biases. So people that are here, maybe they already, they are not like, uh, uh, they have been on treatment for, for a while and uh, they are prevalent users. Uh, and also uh, sometimes uh, when treatment affects the confound, um, confounding and if we measure everything at the same time, uh, so it's like uh, they may already introduce some biases uh, because maybe the confoundings were affected by prior treatment. Uh, 
uh, we can improve the design of the case control study by uh, selecting uh, incident user instead of prevalent users and measuring the confounding before the uh, observed treatment. Uh, but to implement these, we need a kind of longitudinal data uh, from the first time that they become eligible. Uh, we call it enrollment date. So uh, if we uh, structure our data like this by uh, appending the data of it, uh, electronic or uh, data, uh, medical records. So we will have the, for example, we will know that when uh, first time this case A became eligible, we call it enrollment date. So then instead of collecting information at the index date or event date, we can collect the information at the enrollment date. Uh, so, and also like eligibility assessment is before uh, enrollment date, definitely. Then, then we know that if they are eligible and exposure and confounders. Uh, can be uh, assessed at uh, first confounders and then exposures uh, at the after in their enrollment date. Uh, so it is uh, the way that we can improve the design of the case control studies uh, to get uh, uh, to minimize uh, biases. Uh, and uh, as I said, this, a well-designed case control is just a more efficient way of sampling cohort data. Uh, and in this project, our purpose was that, because I said that previously this, um, we have used the causal methods uh, by using the cohort design, but uh, we wanted, the, we, in this project, we wanted to use them uh, and apply them uh, and also uh, produce some guidelines how we can use those methods uh, for case control studies. Uh, and uh, for this project, uh, we use a clinical example, which is the statin use and the risk of fatal and non-fatal MI. Uh, and, uh, and let me say where we bring data for, yeah. Uh, and for the clinical example, uh, we use data from Kaiser Permanent in Washington, uh, KPWA, which is a large healthcare delivery system in the north uh, west of the United States. and. Uh, why we chose this data? Because uh, this, uh, previously our collaborators, they conducted a case control study with 3,000 cases and 9,000 controls um, by, uh, and they validated the cases and control status by medical review. So the case control status is not only based on ICD codes, it's validated by medical records. And uh, so then uh, using this data provides this opportunity for us to have access to full data of the, uh, this EMR and also this um, case control, which is nested in uh, EMR. So it mm, helps us to have like, to be able to do uh, different comparisons, like only cohort by using say uh, Cox model, uh, cohort by causal case, uh, causal methods, and then case control by using uh, always say, better say poorly designed case control, which everything is measured at index state and using the logistic regression and then using the well-designed case control and together with our causal methods, uh, which is causal case control. And it gives us opportunity to just like make different comparisons. Uh, and see which of these uh, methods uh, help us to get the answers closer to, we say, like clinical trials. And why we chose this, like statin and MI, because it's a, it's a well, we, it has been a lot of um, randomized trial, and we know, somehow we know what's the truth. We know the answer based on the meta analysis of randomized trial. Uh, so then by using these methods, we will uh, see that which of these, uh, they, like say, design and also together with method gives us the answer closer to those, uh, closer to the results from the randomized trial. Uh, as I said before, like the, uh, first we start with drafting a protocol of a target trial and try to emulate this target trial by using uh, the data that is available. Uh, I'm not going to uh, like uh, talk about all of these details, but just uh, for example, uh, for eligibility, 
we can uh, almost uh, um, uh, we can emulate almost all of the LGBT criteria that we can have in a, our hypothetical target trial, say age, no previous uh, pre uh, previous statin use, uh, no history of MI or other major comorbidities. Uh, also, in addition to that, we have two more uh, um, uh, LGBT cr criteria because. Uh, we need, uh, we don't do randomization, so we need information on the potential confounders. So then another eligibility criteria is have complete baseline information on all potential confounders. Uh, and also we uh, need to see that they are uh, in the data set for one year to see, to have the, to check the history of MI and other, like no previous starting use. So we need uh, to have a year at least prior uh, to the time that they become eligible. And uh, for, uh, as I said, we can do randomization, uh, but uh, if it's a target trial, they randomize them to either assign statin use or a control group. And uh, so also another difference here is that, oh, sorry, mm, is that for, for example, uh, if it was a trial, we, we gave the uh, participants the specific dose of uh, statin uh, or treatment. Here, it's based on what they is prescribed uh, in the, uh, so we uh, maybe later we can do some sensitivity analysis by uh, categorizing the prescription on the low dose, high dose, medium dose, uh, and uh, yeah, it's the treatment strategy. Uh, and because it's based on the uh, doctor's decision. Uh, also, the, another difference is, is uh, we uh, usually randomized trials uh, are shorter. Uh, the follow-up time is shorter for us we had, because we want to use all information that we have. We have up to seven years uh, uh, of follow-up between uh, 1994, uh, which is the data available uh, for, uh, for us until the end of the December 2010. Uh, so, but it's possible to look at the shorter uh, uh, follow-up times by restricting the follow-up to five or 10 years uh, in sensitivity analysis. Uh, and um, when I said emulated trial is based on the case control with validated outcome. Uh, so target trial also, uh, the event is uh, adjudicated by an uh, endpoint committee to, uh, it's not only based on ICDCOS and exactly we here we saw even our collaborate, collaborators in Seattle say that even this medical review is more accurate than the things that they do in the target trial to assess the outcome uh, status uh, and both like cases, among cases and controls. Uh, so we uh, have a validated uh, me outcome measurement and uh, also the causal interest we can uh, like conduct intention to treat and per protocol analysis for both of them. Uh, after uh, like uh, drafting the outline and see that which parts we can emulate, then we put the data in the structure of the sequential uh, nested trial, which means that is in a long format and based on the unit of the time that you choose, for us it's a month, so each month uh, uh, we have information for all participants from the first time that they become eligible until the end of the follow-up uh, and uh, for uh, each month, which we call it trial. For example, it's the trial 2023 and uh, the ID is it's for like person number one and we have information in uh, the, this structure. Uh, and uh, also uh, this structure is like increasing the statistical efficiency. And uh, so, yeah. Also we can like see the, uh, when um, the, we can be sure that the confounders are measured before treatment. Uh, and so before I go, because let me yeah. just something. Yes. Yeah, and also we adjust uh, in the. I didn't. I don't like uh, say like about details about the all of the analytical methods because it's only a guideline we produce. Like it uh, covers uh, all of the codes uh, that we uh, developed, and also 
uh, all of the um, like uh, like suggestions that we uh, tell to the future um, users how to design the data, how to use these methods. Uh, I uh, just say that for for example for confounding uh, we use uh, IPW uh, to adjust for confounding time varying confoundings, and uh, we also. Um, um, calculate estimated the ITT and uh, per protocol. Uh, we conducted ITT intention to treat and per protocol analysis uh, for uh, the yes to to analyze the data. Uh, it's a summary of results, and uh, let me start from beginning, which is the results. As I said, that we already know somehow the truth. Uh, based on the meta-analysis of RCTs. Uh, the meta-analysis of RCTs shows that uh, the uh, statin use is reducing almost 40% of risk of MI, fatal and non-fatal MI. Uh, when we use the cohort design uh, with uh, cases and non-cases only based on ICD codes, uh, which means that we have not used the validated uh, outcome measurement by medical review. So we get almost null results. It's one zero point one. And when, for it's, these the results are for intention to treat. Uh, when we uh, use the, the uh, case control design, which means that we had uh, uh, information for all cases and we already ascertained the, um, the, the case status by med medical review, and also a subsample of control, say uh, these 9,000 people that I say that, they are also, uh, we, uh, they are, uh, the control status is validated by medical review. Uh, we get the uh, point estimate of 0 0.8 uh, by using uh, intention to treat analysis. Then we, uh, uh, because the adherence uh, also to the treatment, the initial treatment, uh, both in case control data and core data was not high. It was like after, uh, for the people who were under treatment, 40% of them, they uh, like, uh, they didn't adhere to uh, starting after first year and about 60% after five year. Uh, so adherence was not high. Uh, so we adjusted for non-adherence uh, by censoring it, uh, by using the per protocol analysis and censoring it non-adherence. Uh, uh, when we use the same data, cohort design with not validated uh, outcome status, we get the results is like 0 0.8. And when we uh, use the case control design with validated uh, say um, outcome uh, status, we get the 0 0.78. Uh, I also wanted just to show a little bit of the other alternative methods that maybe we usually use or think about them, like uh, using the uh, cohort and using the conventional uh, Cox model. Uh, we get the result is very similar, the ones that we get from intention to treat uh, analysis and also it should be mathematically they are equivalent and uh, the case control design uh, which uh, mm, uh, then yeah another like suggestion was that okay why uh, if you uh, c uh, just sample uh, case control cases and controls among the cohort uh, without validating the information uh, we were expecting to get similar results as when we look at the entire data and we got, uh, it was just to check more. Uh, and uh, because as I said, mathematically they are equivalent. Uh, so we, if we just use the core data and sample case control without doing anything, just conducting the analysis, we get uh, the same results. And uh, we also use the, uh, this like, uh, what we usually use to analyze the case control design, um, like logistic regression. And if you remember everything measured at the index state, the poorly designed logistic regression, uh, we get this, uh, results is very uh, far from the truth. Uh, and 
these are a summary of the results. We have conducted several different sensitivity analyses, and also I didn't show the characteristic of this population. I thought that I did not have enough time. Uh, uh, we have for the core data set, we have uh, about 70,000 uh, individuals, and for a case control data set, uh, about uh, 12,000, but after uh, applying eligibility, about 9,000 each. Uh, for cohort data set, it is the number of the cases were uh, like 1,200, and which was the same, almost the same in case control uh, data. Um, so, for conclusion is that the conclusion of this study so far, which is almost at the end of the study, we just wrap up the analysis and uh, the uh, analytical codes, and hopefully we can submit the paper uh, sometime soon. Uh, is emulating the design and analysis of target trial using case control leads to substantial reduction in the major biases compared to poorly designed uh, conventional case control that I showed that the results completely off. Uh, and also compare also to not validated data. Um, and uh, as I say, this uh, conducting such analysis requires the drafting the detailed protocol uh, of a target, hypothetical tar target trial, and also we need high quality data, which we consider as a limitation because not everyone have access to the data that we have. Uh, so it's uh, because we need high quality and kind of quite dense data uh, from uh, which we usually can get by uh, if we have the opportunity to append our data, if we have a case control already yeah, conducted case control study, if we have opportunity to append the data to electronic medical records, uh, we, maybe we can uh, um, get that high quality data to use these methods, which is mentioned at the beginning of the guideline. If you have this kind of data, then you, you are good to go and use these methods. Otherwise, it's not practical. Uh, at the end, I want to thank some uh, colleagues and collaborators and Harvard School of Public Health and my uh, postdoc advisor, Dr. Donna E, uh, Professor uh, Miguel Hernan, and Barbara Dickerman. She uh, provides uh, also uh, help in, like, uh, and also Roger, both of them to uh, develop the codes, uh, and our collaborators in Kaiser Permanente Washington and University of, University of Washington. And this uh, project is funded by PCORI, and my postdoc is funded by Novo Nordisk uh, Foundation. Uh, thank you, everyone.